I'm a speech pathologist, and as a speech language pathologist in a rehab center, I play two roles. My first role is the traditional role of a speech pathologist working with communicatively impaired patients. Stroke patients most often have a communication disorder called aphasia. A-P-H-A-S-I-A, -A -A, aphasia. Aphasia is a language problem that's secondary to left hemisphere brain injury. If a person has a stroke on the left side of the brain, most often they have a condition called aphasia. Aphasia isn't difficult to understand once you understand the complexity of it. It affects your ability to understand language you hear, to think of words that you want to say, to even gesture the communication intent that you have, your reading and your writing. I think one possible analogy that helps me understand aphasia is if you think about English as a second language or learning French as another language. When you're learning that language, you have difficulty understanding what people are saying. You certainly have difficulty speaking it. You tire really rapidly that it's fatiguing to try to keep up. And that's just how patients perform who have left hemisphere damage resulting in aphasia. Aphasia is characterized by several components, and one of them is called word-finding problems. You and I have had word-finding problems. It's that awful experience when you're trying to think of someone's name. And you know it, and you say, it's just on the tip of my tongue. Uh, wait just a second. And you can't think of it. And you're standing there looking at them embarrassed, thinking, is this a neighbor? Um, someone from the church, a past patient, and you can't remember who the person is. An hour and a half later, you think of the name. Now, we all have had that kind of problem, but aphasic patients have that problem in an exaggerated fashion. They can't sometimes think of just common words. For example, they might say, I need a clean... Um, uh, uh, you know, it's, um, it's got the, with the, and the, um, oh, it's a, I can't think of shirt. A word-finding problem. They search and struggle all day long to find the words they want to express a meaning. Another characteristic of a stroke patient with left hemisphere damage resulting in aphasia would be what's called perseveration. And perseveration is a fancy word for getting stuck in a rut. When you thought of something, and it's correct, and it can't seem to leave your mind, and you just keep saying that same thing over and over again, or you keep doing the same thing over and over again, and you don't want to. Now, we don't have brain injury. You and I haven't had a stroke. And so, one of the things that you and I experience that's similar, but not exactly, is when we say, uh, oh, I heard a song. And it wasn't Whitney Houston, just a minute. It was, um, no, not Whitney Houston. Um, all I can think of is Whitney Houston. And I know it's not Whitney Houston, but I can't stop it from coming into my head. That's what happens to stroke patients with aphasia is they might say, this is a piece of paper, and this is a piece of paper. No, 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 these aren't, this isn't a piece of paper. Let's see, it's a piece of, no, no, not a piece of, it's a p They know they don't want to call this a piece of paper, and they're stuck in a rut. It's called perseveration. Another characteristic of this kind of patient is what's called automatic speech. Automatic speech has its good side and its bad side. The good side is that lots of times patients who have trouble saying anything can automatically say a greeting. A friend comes in and they say, hi, how are you? But for the life of them, when they want to do it again, they can't. 
Automatic speech also might be the ability to say the days of the week or to count. Things that are automatic or memorized or wrote that you don't spend very much time thinking about. Now the flip side, the more annoying side of automatic speech is swearing. And lots of stroke patients swear, even if they didn't swear before, and even if they don't want to. I think it's a combination of several things. Certainly frustration mounts. When you can't say what you want to say, you get frustrated. But also, there is a neurological component to automatic speech, speech that swearing. It's part of the brain injury. And so people might swear when otherwise they would have inhibited that behavior. Sometimes when patients hear themselves doing this, it's so upsetting to them that they will prefer to be quiet and they'll stop talking altogether. My advice to you as you're working with this kind of patient is when that automatic swearing occurs, you go ahead as though it isn't. You look directly at the patient and you go about your business. Another characteristic of this kind of patient is called emotional lability. Emotional lability. And what that is is an exaggerated expression of emotional release. It's usually expressed by crying. Stroke patients cry very easily. They might cry when family comes and they cry when family goes. And they cry when you say, nice job. And they might cry even over things that you don't think are emotionally laden topics. You might come in to do a menu selection. So you've come to talk about your menu. And the thought that now they're going to have to select something and they're going to have to visit with somebody they don't know is frightening and it triggers off this emotional ability and the patient cries. As the brain injury subsides, as some healing improves, emotional ability reduces. But it is important to realize that for the stroke patient, emotional ability is a persistent situation and will probably carry through lifelong. My advice to you when you're dealing with a patient who demonstrates emotional lability is to show some sign of compassion, hand a Kleenex or put your hand on the shoulder, but also go about your business. If you start to acknowledge the emotional ability as truly a clear expression of dissatisfaction or of depression, you'll open the floodgates. If you say, oh, I'm just so sorry, I don't mean to make you unhappy over this, and perhaps I, what will happen is the person will have an outpouring that's almost uncontrollable. It's not therapeutically sound. So show your interest, show your concern, and move along. Stroke patients often have, in addition or separate from aphasia, a communication disorder called dysarthria. And dysarthria is slurred speech, imprecise articulation. It's caused by muscle incoordination and muscle weakness. The tongue and the lips, the soft palate, the jaw, just doesn't move rapidly enough. It isn't precise enough. So you'll get speech that's kind of slurred and run together. Sometimes it's hard to hear. Sometimes it's nasal sounding. You'll need to listen with a third ear. You'll need to watch the person carefully and then say to them what you believe you heard them say. It validates the answer. It validates what they're saying. I do want to caution you about validating with yes and no. Most stroke patients have some yes and no confusion. When you think about yes and no, it really is nothing tangible. You can't say this is a yes. It doesn't have a color or a shape. You don't buy it in a particular store. It's an abstract concept. It just means an affirma affirmative reaction. So they're easy to confuse. When you say to a person, do you like coffee? And they say yes. Then a little bit later, in the same conversation, I would say, do you hate coffee? And if they say yes, 
you realize that, this person has a yes-no confusion that you might not always get valid answers with yes and no. Watch for head nod, head shake, facial expression. It'll probably be more valid than what's actually verbalized. There is one more condition I want you to know about, and that's called apraxia. Apraxia is more difficult to understand. Apraxia is a neurological condition that comes secondary to stroke, and it has nothing to do with muscle weakness or muscle incoordination. In fact, the musculature works fine. The problem is the patient can't make the muscles work fine when they want to. Here's how it's demonstrated communicatively. A person might be able to stick out their tongue to lick their lips, to wet their mouth. But if the speech pathologist says, now stick out your tongue, they can't. They might open their mouth or grimace, do all other kinds of muscle movement, and they can't get their tongue to come out. They might automatically greet someone and say, hello. If you say, say it again, they can't. Apraxia is the inability for voluntary control of the oral musculature. They can do automatic tasks, automatic function, because there isn't paralysis. They can't do it on purpose. Speech is purposeful. Speech communicates what we want to say and what we believe, what we wish for. It controls our environment. So the patient with apraxia very often is not going to be a verbal speaker and will need to use some kind of an augmentative communication device. The speech pathologist helps the, the patient find that device, make it functional, and then use it with other people. Now, let me move on to dysphagia. Dysphagia is the other role the speech pathologist plays. Dysphagia is difficulty chewing, or sucking, or swallowing. It might be something very minor, like food pocketing in the cheek, or food falling out the corner of your mouth. You can still eat, you're just messy. It can be as simple as being able to eat and drink, but you choke when you take your pills, your capsules, your medications. You just dread taking your medicine. Sometimes even you forget doing it because it's such a hassle. But dysphagia can be much more serious. It can run the gamut all the way to the person who can't swallow their own saliva, whose NPO can take nothing orally, has to be sustained nutrition and hydration through some other means. It's a natural role for the speech pathologist to work on dysphagia because we're talking about the same set of musculature, lips, tongue, larynx, soft palate. The same anatomical structures are used for swallow as are used for speech production. So the speech pathologist plays a central role in the dysphagia management program here. One of the things that we focus on are oral phase dysphagia oral phase disorders. Let me be specific. Oral phase of the swallow is voluntary. The patient controls it. It's the ability to close your lips, chew, move the food around in your mouth, enjoy the flavor, enjoy the taste. You can chew as long as you want or you can swallow as rapidly as you want. It's purely voluntary. It's the preparation for the swallow. It's mixing it with saliva, it's masticating it, and then it's moving it to the back of the mouth to initiate a swallow reflex. Now the second phase of the swallow is not voluntary, it's reflexive. When the food hits the back of the mouth, it triggers a swallow reflex. And very quickly, in almost a single motion, the food is moved down the pharyngeal wall the soft palate, that's the back of the roof of your mouth, raises up and closes off the passage to your nose. And it must do that or you'll have food and liquid going up in your nose. 
Now, all of us have had a time when we've taken something carbonated and it fizzes up in your nose and it doesn't feel good. It's because your soft palate didn't raise fast enough to close off the passage to your nose. For many of our patients, the neurologically impaired patient, the muscles of the soft palate are either weakened or slow and velar pharyngeal closure, that's closing off the soft palate, doesn't occur. And the patient gets food and liquid going up into the nasal passage. It's unpleasant and they don't want to eat. Also in the pharyngeal phase of the swallow is the movement of the epiglottis. Now the epiglottis is a small, almost finger-like or tongue-like projection that sits on the anterior wall of the pharynx right above the level of the larynx. Now you remember your larynx is your Adam's apple, it's right here. The epiglottis is right at the top of it on the anterior wall. Now the purpose of the epiglottis is when the food comes by, the epiglottis ever so rapidly flips down and covers over the opening to the trachea. And that's what helps reduce the risk of aspiration. It actually directs the food into the esophagus. Now, just for a moment, think. We have a single tube called the pharynx coming down from the mouth until you get to the voice box. Voice box, Adam's apple, larynx. All words for the same thing. Then right there at the larynx, is the bifurcation or the separation of the trachea and the esophagus. The trachea is the airway, the esophagus is the food tube. The only thing that can go in the airway is air. And when people aspirate, it means that right at the bifurcation of the trachea and the esophagus, some of the food or liquid is going in the trachea. That can't continue. The speech pathologist's job is to come up with kinds of strategies and compensations. In cooperation with the dietitian, we change the bolus, the food, the liquid, to make it accommodate whatever neurological impairment is demonstrated. Additionally, we teach the patient compensations, strategies, postural adjustments, holding their breath, turning their head, doing something different at the time of a swallow to help protect the airway. The third phase of the swallow is the esophageal phase. There are only three phases, oral, pharyngeal, esophageal. The esophageal phase is that phase of the swallow where the food is transported from the larynx, below the larynx, to the stomach. Usually, we can't see that clinically as we're sitting beside and feeding a patient. We can only see that through video fluoroscopy or x-ray technique. But a symptom of esophageal dysfunction, esophageal stage or third stage dysphagia, is when the patient refluxes. Lots of patients have weak peristaltic motion, not just going down, but keeping the food down. So if they lie down to rest, if they bend over, the food backs up. It causes all kinds of problems. They're at risk for strictures, they're at risk for peptic um, ulcers, a condition called esophagitis. Stomach acid is not meant to be in your throat, so we don't want reflux disorders. Often the speech pathologist works with the dietitian as well, working on foods that are less reflux stimulating. It's also a medical issue that the doctor handles pharmacologically. You can see that the speech pathologist and the dietitian work in tandem that I feel as though in dysphagia management I can't do my job effectively without the dietitian. It's a synergistic relationship in a team approach.